Our third speaker uh, today is Professor Dennis McDermott. Dennis has recently, recently taken up the role as Pro Vice, Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous at La Trobe University. He'll be talking about Indigenous hearing loss, um, take Tiger Mountain by strategy. Indigenous health issues can often be described as wicked problems, insolvable, but unresponsive to magic bullets. If the question is Indigenous hearing loss, is the right response clinical, social determinants, or a political one? How do we tackle the whole problem when every element presents barriers or successes? Um, this presentation will explore how Indigenous knowledges might best inform the strategy to deal with the irreducible complexity that hearing loss is. So, Dennis, over to you. Thank you, Tom, and good morning. Is it still morning? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge we are on Gadigal country. In fact, my mother uh, was born and raised about 10 blocks that way. Uh, I grew up in Tamworth, Comoroy country, and I believe my grandfather, who I never met, was from Comoroy country, so there's a connection both ways. So, um, very, very pleased to be here, very pleased to be us. This has been a long time coming. Uh, Kelvin and I have been talking about this for some years, and Tom and others. So I'm really pleased it's here and happening finally. And I thank the first two speakers for setting things up so well. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, where we go from here in terms of a few people have said so far today, we need to work better. And perhaps better has the dimensions of harder or more. It has the dimensions of together. It also has the dimensions of being different. And so a bit about what we can do in those three dimensions, I guess. Um, Okay, I'm just getting all the... <laughs> That's okay. Captions. Captions, yes. So, <coughs> Indigenous hearing loss, we're talking at morning tea, is a sleeper issue. Uh, it's like a whale that's floating beneath the surface and occasionally it surfaces. And it surfaces in headline stories from time to time. But it's very specific aspects come out and hit the headlines. So what's behind those headline stories? What's the complexity? What's the combined things that are going on under the surface or behind that headline story? It is undeniably complex. But when we talk about policy to deal with either better clinical care or prevention or coordinated care or different approaches, does that policy pay due respect to that complexity? Or is it, if not even just a band-aid approach, but a very simplistic kind of attempt to cut through? So just even considering the situation here, are we talking politics? Are we talking clinical response? Are we talking social determinants of health? Well, from listening to Kelvin, the answer is all three. All three. Uh, and we wouldn't, shouldn't underestimate the political dimension of what we're talking about. The problem, as Tom said, is a wicked problem. And politicians, of course, like silver bullets. We know silver bullets are very few and far between. They do come along, they don't necessarily work in the way we want them to work. They're unresponsive to magic bullets. In fact, if you want to talk about hearing loss as part of uh, ear health, I guess one of the things that came to my mind in looking for an analogy to it is that old myth of the Gordian knot. Because uh, if you think about it, why should overcrowding as one dimension of the social determinants. I don't mean to discount nutrition and other elements, but if you take, why should overcrowding in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing lead to over-incarceration? What's the nexus? The two things shouldn't be connected, but they are. You know, and we've mentioned about the studies that Damien Howard and his Aboriginal colleagues in the Northern Territory have done, where they looked at the Aboriginal prisoners in Alice Springs Jail and Darwin Jail some years ago and found that nine out of 10 of them had significant hearing loss, nine out of 10. You know? And they'd say things like, in terms of their last iteration with being picked up or in court, can't hear that court man. Don't understand what that police fellow said. You know? That's the tip of the iceberg. Underneath it is years and years of that uh, hearing loss affecting their life and pushing them closer and closer to inca incarceration. So how do you make sense of that knot of elements Hepatitis media we've heard about, housing, hearing loss is the kind of spindle around which things turn, the anger that can bring to people, 
the mental health, the decreased school performance, the social marginalisation we've talked about already, the, the critical mental health elements of anxiety and depression. We know it builds both of those uh, in terms of people who are having trouble hearing. The decrease in communication in health setting. And Damien Howard, this non-Indigenous psychologist in the Northern Territory, is probably, I guess, one of the leading people in terms of how you clinically intervene in the best way, says sometimes the issue appears to be a lack of cultural safety in clinical care. And, of course, you know, that's what I teach all the time. It's about culturally safe care. He said, but over and above a lack of cultural safety, he said people haven't got the tools to communicate or aren't picking up on the best way to communicate with their patients. So it's about ways of making sure the clinical intervention actually improves the health and the communication. And of course, increasing incarceration. So all this I want to suggest calls for models, models of care, but also policy that respects a holistic approach to what is an irreducible complexity. The Gordian knot is, I think, you know, something uh, a bureaucrat might have a handle on one bit of it, a uh, clinician on another bit, a policymaker somewhere else. But look at the complexity, look at the interconnection with the whole problem. Of course, in mythology, this is the way they solve the problem, <laughs> not uh, a million miles away from our political masters today, you know. Take one big, bold slash at it, get a lot of headlines, uh, but do you resolve the problem or do you wound more? Do you just, just hack into it, in a sense? So we need ecological solutions, things that respect that and embrace complexity. The difficulty is when you present a policy, which to policymakers looks a bit like this tree here, it's seen as too wild. And someone, we've talked a little bit, but not much about the R word here today, racism. But racism can also come in terms of respect or disrespect for knowledge approaches and for comprehension of a problem. If a policy uh, solution is deemed by policy entrepreneurs, is one of the terms I've learned in the last five or six years, policy entrepreneurs as being too wild or different or other, then it's dismissed as unworkable and not fit for purpose. So if a policy is seen as that, a thing that uh, with Professor Fran Baum at Flinders University will be working on some ARC work which led us to this idea of policy topiary. So if it's seen as too wild, it can lead to this. Nice, neat, simple, unfit for purpose. Certainly not ecological. So I'm gonna draw on some work we've done in Adelaide over the last five or six years with an ARC, uh, particularly, sorry, this is an NHMRC, looking at uh, Aboriginal driver's license and using it as an example, example it should have been exemplar, but it wasn't. It was actually it was a bad example of how policy cut through. A really lovely policy was developed and then it was whittled down and whittled down and whittled down to a little trial on one part of the state. So what went wrong? We found the complexity itself was actually a challenge. And these are quotes from some of the people we interviewed for this particular bit of work. This area needs some substantial change, but getting in the right environment and the right people and the right wording to get approval for that substantial change has been a bit complex. So, code for it, I'm not going to take it any further. Why we all the shears? This was a very interesting finding, that thinking and planning and reflection as part of the build-up to a complex response to a complex situation is not valued as much in governmental circles and policy bureaucracy as clear outputs. And this, this uh, interview comment says it all. Policy is not seen as a, the favourable thing. They want action, not policy. You can't be seen to be wafting round too much in the breeze while you sort things out. We found there was a great time imperative to cut to the chase, no matter, even if it's a simplistic solution, just give me a solution now and that we can get on with the business, not too much wafting around. Racism crept in. Uh, this was a whole uh, health and all policies bit of work. And so it brought together several dimensions of government to work on one problem of Aboriginal driver's licensing getting in the road of a lot of things that had health outcomes, social outcomes. And yet the police kept objecting about standards, standards of driving. And if you did something uh, particular, that was special treatment. We've heard that. Well, I can't tell you the first time I heard that in the mainstream press. It was Janet Albrechtson from The Australian, I think about 20 years ago, talking about special treatment. 
what's called population health. It's not special treatment, it's population health, tailing your responses to the situation in front of you. I'll get off my high horse. So I love this quote, this quote. It was really challenging the fact of setting up for Aboriginal persons a different approach that was unique to them. And the resistance, was it the right thing to do from a road safety perspective, to have that approach for a particular group of people in the community? Yeah, but no. So that resistance is real. I find that resistance in teaching students. I find that with health professionals. I find that with policymakers. We have to have strategies if we're going to deal with this complex problem of dealing with resistance, I would suggest. This is a very complexly worded quote, uh, but it, it makes the point, I think, that, and I'll, I'll let you read the original jargon language and I'll try and translate it for you. But even if a proposal has got strong evidence backing it up, it might fail to actually survive the policy making process intact. Because of a comprehension, a joint comprehension, a shared understanding, the process of dialogue reflects, reflects different ways of approaching, different discourses that are in fact incom, inc, I can't even say the word, incommensurable. They are ships that pass in the night. They're talking two different languages. The language used to judge the proposal reflects different conceptual paradigms, different ways of thinking and understanding the world and different values. This is a huge problem. If we're going to get people to actually take seriously the complexity we've talked about today, the need to work together in innovative ways, harder and better, then we need to be talking the same language. We need to find ways to share our comprehension of what's going on and that different values don't get in the way, I would suggest. This is John Kington, American policy theorist worked for a long time in the policy community and wrote some good textbooks about it. And he says, policy entrepreneurs rule. They judge their gatekeepers. They judge what lets get through the policy process. And proposals that survive in the policy community are compatible with the values of those policy Proposals that don't fit with the specialist values have less chance of survival than those that do. So if we're talking Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander policy, Sometimes those values are seen as other, not little o other, but capital O other. Different and that's not okay. It doesn't fit with my values, my, my worldview. I know now when I'm working with students that I have to recognise there's a level of what we psychologists call cognitive dissonance going on. That no fact, no bit of data can stand on its own. It, it garners an emotional response. And if the fresh information is disturbing enough, it railroads the whole, derails the whole process. So we, in our teaching strategies, we're now trying to find ways to actually deal with that cognitive dissonance, to hold people through that first disturbance to come out the other side. Maybe in the policy sphere, we need something similar. So what gets lost when you, you don't, when you want action, not policy? I love this little cartoon. Well, that's created a little order in a world of chaos. That can be the response we end up with when policy is seen as too scary, too complex, too hard, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander solutions are seen as other, that's what you end up with, which is not, may I suggest, fit for purpose. Part of it is this difficult business of going beyond motherhood and acceptance and understanding of social determinants. Now we're switching research here. So Fran Baum at Flinders was one of the chief investigators. I was one too on some work we did around um, looking at the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan that came out in 2013, for the decade 2013 to 2023. And it was rightly hailed as a groundbreaking, groundbreaking plan. And the reason it was hailed is for the first time, a national plan of this kind talked about culture. The culture was central to the plan. It talked about the social terms of health, and it talked about racism. It didn't talk about incarceration, but that's another story. Racism got on the agenda for the first time in a national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health plan. And it had to be fought for. And the reason it got on was there was a strong coalition of Aboriginal academics and practitioners, I think Tom, you're there in the forefront of this national forum, pushing it and holding the bureaucrats and holding the policy makers, you know, gaze to what was happening. Uh, the resistance came out, resistance to unfamiliar processes. Uh, so it raised the question for us, well, what works? Why did this particular plan actually go from the agenda to actual full-on policy? What was different about this plan and the way it was developed? One of the things we realised was in the end, and Tom can speak better than I can, it might have been bloody hard going, 
But in the end, there was a shared recognition of the permanence of health. Uh, all parties in the end agreed you can't look at health in isolation. A consensus developed around a social determinants approach. And it seems the reason uh, from our informants, we had both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal informants talking to us, it seems the reason that uh, that was arrived at was because social determinants moved from motherhood, as one person said when being taken out to community and see what, seeing what was going on, for the first time I could see the living and breathing side of social determinants. So with Sam's story today about uh, the 36-year-old Aboriginal woman, 18 presentations to jail, that's a living side of the social determinants. You know, we need the data, we need the evidence, but we need the narratives and we need the barriers to actually understand how we can make the change, I would suggest. Is that the big five, Tom? Okay, here we go. <coughs> so what was different about the plan? Uh, the strong advocacy coalition I've talked about. Um, uh, there's a quote from one of the people we were meeting regularly. We developed our common agenda. We knew what we agreed upon, making sure we were strong connected. And I think this goes to the heart of what Kelvin's talking about with the national strategy. Certainly you need a strategy. You need a body to push that strategy that's got some growth. Uh, Kingdon actually calls it a claim to a hearing. You establish by your authority and your doggedness and your uh, credentials and your evidence uh, and your passion that you have a claim to a hearing and you're not going to get, leave the room and they're not going to leave the room until they listen to you, I would suggest. Taking Tiger Mountain by strategy. This is Brian Eno way back when. Uh, if you'd emerged from Roxy Music and was writing film scores and doing electronica. Um, and the title of one of his solo albums, I loved it, Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy. But of course it goes way back to, uh, is it The Art of War or something? Lao Tzu, I think, the idea of uh, strategy. Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy. So we need some strategy here. We can have a strategic approach to it. But the strategy is, is recognising, this, this is a quote from uh, Uncle Lewis Yulaburka O'Brien, Ghana and Uncle Lewis is quite a character for those of you who know him. And he always says, and this is from his ghost-written biography, what's beneath the story? Our strategy needs to know what's behind, between the lines. And I like this quote. The most profound philosophy I learned from our people is the idea of seeing the world differently in two ways, of holding two things simultaneously in your ken. What's the hidden story? If you see the mountain, what's behind the mountain? What's on the other side? What do you need to know to get to where you need to go? So I want to suggest there's a lot of Aboriginal knowledge out there that we can actually bring into our strategy development and strategy success. This is Nori, as my friend, my non-Aboriginal friend Dave Schoberg says uh, around the mouth of the Murray Kurung, uh, Narangeri country. He says, these are Noris. Lately, they've been called pelicans, <laughs> but they're Noris. So drawing on that Aboriginal knowledge, this is Uncle Lewis, and he's showing a string trick to Auntie uh, Miriam Rose. Uh, and uh, the string trick is interesting because it says, you know, passing on average knowledge, what's the trick, what's the trick, what's the trick? Tell me how it's done. No, no, what's the trick, what's the trick? You have to get it. You have to understand the processes going on yourself. No one is going to unpick the trick for you and show you how it's done. You have to sharpen your powers of observation, learn to shut up, to deep listen, as Auntie Miriam Rose would say, Tune in and you'll understand how it works. And that's our task. That's our task with the policymakers and the politicians to get them to actually look at this hidden stuff. It's behind the mountain stuff so they can actually do things differently. So Aunty Miriam Rose talks about the dairy deep listening. I think I've found a verb for every Aboriginal nation and language group I've looked at, I've found a verb that correlates to deep listening. It's in our ways of working, it's in our DNA. And I teach our medical students and other students, if you can deep listen, you can be a much better practitioner. You have to shut up and tune into the person in front of you. So our job with policymakers is to get them to shut up and tune into the complexity of the problem, I would suggest, that's in front of them. Two minutes. Um, it has par parallels, this approach of holding things in Ken at the same time. It means it's not either or. It's not black or white. We've known this for thousands of years. The Taoists in China have known it for thousands of years too. It's called yin and yang, isn't it? Both sides are important, night and day. So we need to hold those disparate things in care at the same time to find a complex solution. But Indigenous knowledge can help us unravel that Gordian knot, I would suggest. And here from uh, um, Central Australia, I love this uh, description of Kanyini. Uh, of course, it's about interconnectedness of all things. 
But that's activated through us taking a stewardship approach. Not just, we talked earlier about accountability. And Western notions of accountability, I think, are a bit thin. Aboriginal notions of accountability are you have a responsibility. You are the stewards of what's going on. You need to step up. Yeah? That's accountability. And that's, I think, what's going to change us for us. That stewardship implies a conscious and conscientious embrace of responsibility for proactively fostering national health and well-being, not just the Band-Aids. Two more slides, Tom, I think. And again, informed by Aboriginal knowledge, nupachi nupachi. Reciprocity. You know, if you're going to work with community, it has to be that two-way connection, learning from, learning with, and being responsible again. And this is the mouth of the Murray, uh, the Coorong, where the uh, River Murray, I've been in Adelaide for 10 years, and I say the River Murray, not the Murray River. Uh, the River Murray meets the sea. But in fact, it's a Yolnu term called Ganma. And Ganma explains where the fresh water comes down from the land to meet the salt water coming in from the sea. And since the fresh water is conceptualized as Aboriginal knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, and the salt water is Western knowledge. And the two don't have to exist separately. When they come together, foam is created. And that foam is new knowledge. And that's Ganma. Whoops, one back. It's my final slide. So I love this concept of Ganma because I think it's a way we can actually get somewhere. It says when we bring Aboriginal knowledge to the, to the table uh, with Western knowledge, the two come together, something new, that Ganma, that foam is created, uh, it leads to deeper understanding and ways of solutions of what we're looking for. Ganma allows what we don't know we don't know to emerge because we're working from a different paradigm or the wrong paradigm. It allows that new knowledge to emerge. I love this final quote. Janet Kelly's quoting some Aboriginal authors here. In order to hear the quiet sounds of foam, one needs to listen with one's heart, to bring heart into the policy-making process. Uh, I was very moved by Kelvin's uh, presentation. We need that mix of data and heart to be aware of experiencing, of the experiencing, not just the experiences. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to have there, Dennis. You've got plenty of questions, no doubt. Um, right, open up any questions of uh, Dennis, comments? And can we encourage our online participants to, to also uh, have an input? Yes, Nikki, go on. <laughs> it's fine, Nikki. Um, exactly what you said about the mountains and things like that, because... Um, Kelvin mentioned it before, but I was sort of talking to him at the time, um, about that we deal with the problem. We have to look back at the issues before that. You know, we're dealing with the kids with the problems with their ears and hearing and that, but we're not looking at housing, nutrition way back. We're dealing with all these medications here. We need to look way back here at some of the issues, and I don't think we engage enough with each other looking at the issues way back. Look, I agree. And that quote I did from the Aboriginal Road Safety Research, which said, you know, you can't be seen to be wafting around the breeze too long. You're reflecting forever. Look, we've got a, it's been going for a couple of years now. Can you please just give us the, the solution? You know, uh, I had, when I was teaching medical students, we had a, a Flinders, it's a graduate entry medical program, and a guy came up to me after a cultural safety workshop and he said, thanks, Professor McDermott, I really enjoyed that. I think what you need to know about we medical students is we are concrete thinkers. Just give us solutions. So even in the profession, there's not this idea of reflection being an important part of what you do. You know, you're either a doer or you're a thinker. Well, you know, that can coexist. So we need that thinking process part of the policy process, I would suggest, to uncover those things you're talking about. Thanks very much for that. I really found that very interesting. And You'd be interested to know we talk about Dadiri in the Sydney University Medical Program as well, but I hadn't heard about Ganmar, and I think that's a really valuable contribution. What I was going to ask, though, is th this two ways of thinking requires a bit of reciprocity on both sides, and where there's, you know, if you look at the statement from the heart, there was an immediate reaction to say we're not talking about any of this. What happened? You know, have you got any? solutions to that circumstance where there's not not even the opportunity to talk about something you know it's things are immediately cut off which seems to happen a lot i think in this space 
I'm full of solutions. My partner says too many uh, because, you know, um, yeah, humility is a good one. Uh, one of the things we've realised with teaching students, I think teaching is a really powerful way to uncover where the barriers are. And I talked about this idea of resistance and the idea of cognitive dissonance. And although it's a psychological term, I think it's really true. Whenever any of us have some fresh information come into our purview that actually seems to really jar with our existing worldview, it's like it pulls the planks from underneath us. It pulls out that safe, secure ground we're on and we get scared and we go like that. And so the only way through that with our students we've found is to actually make that disquiet, we call it manageable disquiet. It's comfortable enough. We build the relationship so they trust us enough to ask the difficult questions, have the hard conversations, uh, and then to stay with us through that period of turmoil. So in uh, the north of Western Australia, there's a term there called, if I get the pronunciation right, karnya nyimpa, karnya nyimpa, and it means holding. And the idea um, is in that particular uh, nation, uh, it's the term for when the boys are becoming men, the older men hold the boys through that transition into manhood, the emotionally challenging and the spiritually challenging <laughs> boys, they hold them spiritually and emotionally through that through that journey. So that's might sound strange. We're bringing that into our, into our um, pedagogy now. The idea is you hold students through the challenging time. I don't know how you hold uh, a Scott Morrison or a, of course you don't have to hold Tony Abbott anymore, but, you know, um, emotionally, <laughs> spiritually, I think that's sort of where we're at at the moment, that we have to create that safety to have these hard conversations for people, you know, not to reject the idea out of hand, to stay with it until the strangeness dis dissipates. Until they say, we get it in, in, in semester long topics, you know, you might get resistance, 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 and in week 10, someone says, I get it now. I get it now. Might burst out in tears. It might be a road to Damascus moment. It might be a quiet moment. But they suddenly get it. They've allowed the defences to, to dissolve and take in the fresh information. And that's where we're at in this country with Aboriginal knowledge. You know, it hasn't been spelled out in ways that Maori knowledge has been spelled out in New Zealand for decades. So our task is to spell out this knowledge and say it's part of the fabric of Australia. Just listen. Just listen.